From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. The endless supply of larger-than-life characters in Alaska makes the state fertile ground for reality television shows and movies based on true stories. I have yet to run out of ideas for my podcast, and in my latest novel, Carlic Bones, I based the plot around actual events and real Alaska characters. If you made a list of the strong, fascinating individuals in the history of this vast state, though, Joe Vogler would rank near the top. Picture a sharply dressed man wearing a fedora, a flannel shirt, and a bolo tie while he stands in front of a group of rowdy people and proclaims his controversial opinions in a booming voice. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Joe Vogler developed a large following of folks who agreed with his politics, but he also made many enemies. When he disappeared from his remote home, People wondered if an enemy had killed him, or if the murderer was someone who claimed to be his friend and colleague. Vogler, born in Kansas on April 24, 1913, earned his law degree from the University of Kansas. He took a job in Texas during World War II, but was fired when he denounced FDR as a communist. Vogler moved to Alaska in 1942 and lived in Kodiak for a year, where he worked on a military construction project. He then moved to Fairbanks and became a civilian employee of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In 1951, Vogler began mining on Homestake Creek near Fairbanks and staked out a 320-acre homestead. Vogler spent the next 50 years working as a miner and developer, and he emerged as one of the most outspoken politicians in the state. Joe Vogler hated the U.S. federal government and felt Alaska should secede from the United States. Many Alaskans shared Vogler's opinion. Rich in natural resources such as gold, copper, oil, timber, salmon, and crab, secessionists believed Alaska should become an independent nation instead of sharing its wealth with the rest of the U.S., Furthermore, Vogler and his followers complained that Washington politicians did not understand Alaskans and the Alaska way of life. In 1973, Vogler circulated a petition calling for the secession of Alaska from the United States, and in three weeks, he gathered 15,000 signatures. In the 1970s, Vogler formed the Alaska Independence Party, or the AIP, and Vogler stated, I'm an Alaskan, not an American. I've got no use for America or her damned institutions. He also said, The fires of hell are frozen glaciers compared to my hatred for the American government, and I won't be buried under their damn flag. I'll be buried in Dawson. And when Alaska is an independent nation, they can bring my bones home. Vogler ran for governor of Alaska three times, and his radical views not only made him famous in Alaska, but also throughout the U.S. The CBS program 60 Minutes recorded a piece on Vogler, and Joe told the commentator, I pledge my efforts, my effects, my honor, my life to Alaska, and to hell with America. In 1986, Vogler's bid for governor garnered 5.5 percent of the vote, gaining the AIP status in Alaska as a recognized political party. Joe's wife, Doris, shared his extreme political views, and when she died in 1992, instead of burying her in Alaska, Vogler buried her in Dawson in the Yukon Territory. 
Vogler badly missed Doris, and by the age of 80 in 1993, he had slowed down and showed signs of depression. Even after Doris's death, though, Vogler remained active in politics. He believed when the U.S. made Alaska a state, the federal government violated a United Nations charter it had signed. The charter declares a nation must allow a territory self-determination on a vote on independence. Vogler claimed the federal government denied Alaska and Hawaii a vote on whether they wanted to become a state, remain a territory, or pull away from the United States and become an independent nation. Vogler wished to present his case in front of the UN General Assembly, and he searched for a country to sponsor him. In 1993, Iran invited Joe to speak in front of the UN. His speech would have embarrassed the United States government. On Friday, May 29, 1993, only a week before his planned trip to New York to speak to the UN, Vogler ate dinner with a friend, and according to the friend, Joe seemed in good spirits. Later the same evening, another friend who had once run on Joe's gubernatorial ticket as the candidate for lieutenant governor claimed he called Joe on the phone, and after talking for several minutes, Joe abruptly ended the call, saying someone was at his door. Over the next two days, the friend said he tried several times to contact Joe by phone, but Joe never answered. So, he finally drove to Vogler's house to check on him. Who would kidnap or kill an 80-year-old man? Unfortunately, the troopers initially faced a long list of suspects. Joe wasn't a reclusive old miner minding his own business. He had strong opinions and didn't hesitate to let people know what he thought. Joe Vogler made plenty of enemies in his 80 years. Some members of the AIP felt certain the U.S. government had silenced Joe. Joe frequently quarreled with the U.S. Park Service, and he made it no secret he felt federal government should stay out of Alaska. His upcoming speech at the United Nations was sure to anger many in Washington, D.C. Perhaps the feds decided it was time to eliminate Joe Vogler, a man who had been a thorn in their sides for decades. Alaska state troopers believed someone murdered Joe and buried his body somewhere in the vast wilderness near Fairbanks. They doubted the idea of a government conspiracy and thought Joe's murderer was either someone in the AIP making a power play or a burglar. Joe still held a great deal of sway in the AIP, and there were those eager to usurp him and take control of the party. Joe also made no secret of the fact that he kept gold and other valuables in his home. Could his death have been a robbery gone wrong? Many in the AIP felt the friend who first declared Joe missing should top the trooper's list of suspects. If he'd been as worried about Joe as he claimed, why did he wait two days after their last communication before he checked on Joe? Also, the story he told the troopers about Vogler suddenly leaving their phone conversation when someone knocked on Vogler's door seemed like a convenient way to point the blame at someone else while providing himself with an alibi. Those close to Joe told the troopers that one of Vogler's dogs was fiercely loyal and would have protected Joe with its life. Officers took a blood sample and found sedatives in the dog's system. The use of drugs to neutralize at least one of Joe's dogs pointed to someone close to Joe, a person who knew Vogler and his dogs well. This fact made the friend who had first reported Joe missing seem even more suspicious to some. This friend had known Joe for years and was there when Joe first formed the AIP. Joe's wife, Doris, despised the man, though, and often quarreled with him. She did not feel he could be trusted, and eventually the man maintained his distance from Joe and Doris. After Doris died, however, the man began once again to grow close to Joe. Not long after he re-entered Joe's life, someone vandalized Joe's earth-moving and mining equipment, and many of Joe's other friends felt this man might have been responsible. 
The man told several in the AIP he was Joe's rightful heir. If he believed this claim, then perhaps he had a reason to murder Joe. Troopers investigated Joe's friend, but found nothing linking him to Vogler's disappearance. In late August, Alaska Lieutenant Governor Jack Cogill, another one of Joe's friends, said the troopers told him they had narrowed their suspect list to three individuals, two from Alaska and one from Oklahoma. Meanwhile, authorities and Fairbanks residents searched for Joe's body, knowing once winter arrived with falling snow and a frozen ground, Joe's body would remain hidden at least until spring. In February, the AIP held its annual convention and handed out bumper stickers, T-shirts, and buttons with the slogan, Where's Joe? Let me pause for a moment to thank the creative folks at Best Fiends for supporting this podcast. In case you have not heard of it yet, Best Fiends is a mobile puzzle game app, and I love it. The bright, colorful fiends make me laugh, but it's the engaging puzzles that have kept me playing the game for the past year. I think this game has made me better at analyzing true crimes, because in Best Fiends, not only must you strategize to complete the current puzzle and move on to the next level, but you must also take a step back and analyze the entire scene to understand all the aspects of the puzzle. I was recently stuck on a level, and after failing it several times, I noticed the shrouded rockets in the bottom left-hand corner of the game. Once I uncovered the rockets, I easily completed the assigned tasks and moved on to the next level. You must also understand your fiends and their weapons and how and when to use them. My husband and I have decided not to take our annual winter vacation this year and will stay at our home in the middle of the Kodiak wilderness. I am certain I will spend time every day with my best fiends. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. In May, when the snow melted, troopers concentrated their search for Vogler near an old mining area called Skoogie Gulch off the Steese Highway north of Fairbanks. The authorities seemed to have specific information regarding Joe's whereabouts, and Trooper Jim McCann stated he would search until he found Joe's body. The search yielded no body, but McCann felt he knew who had murdered Vogler. McCann needed more evidence, but since the man he suspected was already in jail for another crime, McCann believed he had time to make a case against him. Nearly a year after Joe disappeared, an informant from Anchorage contacted the troopers. He said the previous May, an acquaintance borrowed his truck for a quick trip to Fairbanks. When the man returned the vehicle, he'd painted it a different color, and one of the doors had a bullet hole in it. The informant decided to contact authorities when he realized his acquaintance had borrowed his truck only days before Vogler disappeared. When troopers looked through the vehicle, they found a roughly drawn map showing the roads leading to Vogler's house and they found a day planner with notations written in a sort of code. One entry read, Joe, dollar sign, gold. The acquaintance who borrowed the truck was named Manfred West, an individual known to the troopers as a petty thief and sometimes artist. Troopers remembered a call from Darlene Dawkin, the manager of a trucking company in Fairbanks, soon after Joe Vogler disappeared. She said two months earlier, Manfred West told her he was working for Vogler and went down into Vogler's basement. West told Dawkin, you should have seen the stuff he had down there. West described a stash of gold and other treasures, and Dawkin said she thought, if something happens to Joe Vogler, I'll report this guy. 
McCann felt West killed Joe Vogler, possibly during a robbery. Since West recently had been imprisoned for stealing $5,500 from his girlfriend's mother, McCann thought he had time to build his case before interrogating the man. Unfortunately, though, on May 27, 1994, Manfred West walked out of the low-security wing of the prison where he was incarcerated. McCann's suspect disappeared into the Alaska wilderness. McCann suspected West had run to his stepbrother's remote cabin, so he assembled a tactical team of six troopers and drove to the residence. As the authorities approached the cabin, West exited the back door, saw the officers, and retreated indoors. He yelled at the troopers not to come near him because he had a rifle and explosives taped to his chest. McCann called the cabin and talked to West for nearly four hours while a tactical team waited to assault the cabin. West confessed he had entered Vogler's house, planning to steal Joe's gold. He said he thought the house was empty, but Vogler confronted him with a shotgun. West claimed Joe shot once into the air and then fired at the pickup truck. West said he panicked and shot at Vogler with his 22 caliber pistol killing Joe instantly. Wes then wrapped Vogler's body in a blue tarp and later buried him. Wes continued to talk to McCann, but he refused to surrender, and his mental state began to deteriorate. Troopers noticed smoke and flames coming from the cabin, and Wes twice ran outside, but then returned to the burning building. Firefighters arrived on the scene, but when they heard several small explosions, they stayed away from the burning structure, concerned about the possibility of a large blast. Finally, when the roof caved in, the firefighters entered the cabin and were amazed to find West still alive, huddled in a small tunnel under a cinder block wall. Once he had West in custody, McCann tried to sit down with him for a formal interview but West refused to talk and asked for a lawyer. Prosecutors charged Manfred West with first-degree murder, but after a plea bargain, he was convicted of second-degree murder and evidence tampering. The judge sentenced him to 75 years in prison. Despite telling McCann he murdered Joe Vogler during an attempted robbery, he stated under oath that he killed Vogler during an illegal plastic explosive sale gone wrong. Many years later, West admitted he killed Vogler when the old man surprised him during a robbery. West did not tell authorities where he stashed Joe's body, but he told his cellmate where he buried Joe, and the cellmate reported the information to troopers. The tip led authorities to the woods northeast of Fairbanks, near the Chena Hot Springs Road. With the help of cadaver-sniffing dogs, they uncovered Vogler's body, still wrapped in the blue tarp. Although Vogler never held an elective office in the state of Alaska, Governor Walter J. Hickel ordered the state flags lowered to half-mast for three official days of mourning. At Joe's funeral, an Alaska state flag draped his coffin. His ashes were buried next to his wife in Dawson. West again appeared in the news in 2016 when he sent a package from the Palmer Correctional Facility in Palmer, Alaska to an art studio in Lowville, New York, where West once lived. The package contained a letter and two paintings signed by West. When the gallery owner's husband contacted the prison, he learned West, then age 60, was an exemplary prisoner and loved to paint. He'd heard about the gallery opening in Lowville and wanted to send the paintings, telling the owner to keep any proceeds to help with her new business. Controversy still swirls around the murder of Joe Vogler. While Manfred West claims he acted alone, some in Joe's political party believe the United States government executed Joe, 
because he was about to appear before the United Nations to address the issue of Alaska independence. Others believe the friend who reported Vogler missing hired West to kill Vogler. Vogler left his estate to his nephew, but the suspicious friend sued, stating he was the rightful heir to Joe Vogler. Who drugged Joe's dog? Manfred West never admitted to sedating the dog. Was someone else involved in the death of Vogler? Will we ever know for sure who murdered Joe? Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.